Reformed Church. You know, it, it's so important to understand what we were just saying because so, so, so many Christians uh, wouldn't, just wouldn't have any problem with talking about waiting on the Lord's timing for a lot of things. And man, if the Lord has a particular time in mind, it's because he's waiting for us. It really, really is. Um, I shared you, with that, that verse with you guys a while ago, which I'll just share it with you again because it is really a profound thing when you understand how the promises of God works. Uh, the promise of God work. Um, let's see. All right. This is um, Second Peter three, verse eight. Let's actually just start with verse nine. Second Peter three nine. Um, such an important thing. Which, again, this is talking about a particular promise of the Lord, but this is how the promises of God work. And it's just applying this pr particular principle to one particular promise that God has made, and that would be the second coming of Jesus, right? The Lord has promised um, that he would come again, right? We have that promise in Scripture. It's something that we are waiting for. But the funny thing is, okay, so the Lord gave us a promise. We're waiting for that promise to come to pass, right? And I would say of all the promises of God, you might think that that particular promise is really just in God's timing, right? Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of promises that we have in Scripture, a lot of guarantees that we have in Scripture, that if we believe these things, they will manifest in our, life, in our lives, right? So that, that's um, a thing we know. But if there's any promise that you might think was actually just in God's timing, you might think that it was the second coming of Christ. That, you know, Maybe he has some reason behind it, but that it is in God's timing. But the funny thing is, it said the Lord is not slack, or that means like slothful, slow. He's not slack or slow concerning his promise. Because it has been a while, right? It's been over 2,000 years since Jesus um, ascended. And um, the promise of his second coming has been sort of, um, uh, what's the word? simply hasn't come to pass yet, even after the 2,000-some-odd years. And it says, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise. And you would think, well, that seems slow. If someone promises you something and then takes 2,000 years to fulfill it, you might assume that that's pretty slow, right? Most people don't take 2,000 years to fulfill a promise. But he said he's not slow or slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness or slowness. But is long-suffering, that means patient, to usward. To us, where it is just toward us in King James. So he's actually, he's being patient, he says. And his patience is with us. And um, what in particular is he being patient with us about? He says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is the acknowledgement of the truth. The Bible says that repentance results in the acknowledgement of the truth. Um, that's all that repentance is. It's... Um, turning your attention from whatever it was on to acknowledging the truth. And it says that that's what he's being patient about. The Lord is not slow, even though it has been slow. He's not being slow. 2,000 years is a long time. But he's not being slow concerning his promise. He is actually being patient with people. And that principle, man, is something that if you would apply that to the, to the um, promises of God, far fewer people would become mad at God about a lot of things, if they understood how the promise of God worked in general. He is not being slow. He's being patient with us. And in particular, what he's being patient with is he's being patient with people's acknowledgement of the truth. Um, I won't go into all the details of this particular scenario because we know that in this scenario, um, the Lord is waiting for a certain number of people to get saved before he comes the last large group that the Bible talks about that gets saved in the last is the Jewish people. Um, not that every Jewish person is going to get saved, but that there's going to be something of a revival. And I use that word accurately there, because revival is something that you wouldn't want to use about for a believer, because we're already alive in Christ. But, um, but they will be made alive, and there will be a revival amongst the Jewish people. But regardless of, of the details of this particular verse, the Lord is waiting for his temple to be fully built. That means he's waiting for a certain amount of his elect, the people that he knows will accept him, to actually accept him and get saved, and then Jesus will come back. Um, 
And there definitely are questions about that in particular on how that all works. But um, you know, if you have more questions about that, we could talk about that after service. But, um, but that is what he's waiting for. And even this verse shows that. There are other verses as well. Um, but this verse shows that he's waiting for people to come to repentance. Knowing that repentance is the acknowledgement of the truth, he's saying his patience is always with us. The reason why Jesus has not come back again is not because he, he somehow is saying to himself, I personally have some kind of timing of my own that I, you know, I want to put off for another, you know, however many years. Um, the Lord is willing to come back now. He, he himself is willing to come back now. Um, the Bible even says, right, that today is the day of salvation. And t- t- today is the day that the Lord wants us to enter the things that are ours. Today is the day the Lord wants people to get saved. But not all of the Lord's elect, whom he knows will acknowledge the truth, have acknowledged the truth. And it is the people's, it is people's acknowledgement of the truth that causes the promise of God to come to pass. That applies to this particular verse, and it applies to any promise. The Bible says that um, we've received great and precious promises from the Lord. It's actually in the same book, in, in, in chapter 1. That we've received great and precious promises um, from the Lord, and by these we can partake of his divine nature. But the thing is, also in that chapter, it says that the promises of God don't manifest and come to pass in our lives unless we understand them, unless we know them. It's through knowledge that these things are multiplied into our life. And so while people, most Christians are waiting on God, that's a really dangerous place to be when you're waiting on the Lord. Because if two people are waiting for each other, probably not a whole lot's going to get done. You ever have that where there's maybe a miscommunication? Someone's waiting on you to do something. You're waiting on them to do something. And that just is going to stall things for quite a while. And when we're waiting on the Lord to bring something to pass in our life, and he's waiting on us to do something, uh, that's going to prolong things quite a bit. When Christians, it's such a dangerous thing for Christians to be waiting on the Lord because from the Lord's perspective, he's already paid the price for the inheritance. The inheritance is already ours. Even for the whole world, the inheritance, there's a door for the inheritance for the entire world. And where the Lord has made a door, he's just waiting for people to acknowledge that door. He's waiting for people to acknowledge that inheritance that he's already provided. And for believers, um, he's waiting for us to listen to him and learn from him to acknowledge the inheritance that we already have. And it's that knowledge. We're actually responding to God. Um, That's why the Bible said that he loved us first. Because now it's a matter of, see, the Lord has, has already loved us in sending Jesus and providing these things to us. He made the first move. He loved us first. What's left now is for us to love him. And that love, though, is not just affection. The way that we demonstrate our love to God is through our knowledge. It's through faith. Um, the Bible says that, I believe this is in 1 Peter, it says that though we haven't seen the Lord, we love him. And though having not seen him, yet believing. The way that we love God is by believing him. That's why we love the Lord with our heart. It's our heart particularly, which is another word for like our, our, the place of our thinking, our mind. Um, and that's how we love God. So the Lord made that move, and anything that happens now is on people's end responding to him with knowledge. The Lord can't do anything more than he's already done. This is why he made one sacrifice for all time, the book of Hebrews says, and then sat down at the right hand of God. So if we're waiting on God, and then you t- take a look at at the Father's right hand and see Jesus sitting. No matter what need occurs in your life, no matter what tragedy happens in the earth, no matter what calamity is going on, um, Jesus remains seated. And when you look at that and you're waiting on the Lord, that really might offend you to see the Lord sitting down. Because, and a lot of people assume that God is sort of in heaven with his arms crossed, just sort of sitting there and being cold and being insensitive to people's needs because they say there's needs here and why is there there's so much suffering in the world and then why don't you do anything about it? Um, uh, most atheists that I've heard speak bring that point up about suffering in the world, which the funny thing is, though, that is not an argument for there not being a God. That's an, that's an emotional argument. And I think a lot of atheists, um, I, I could talk about this for, for a longer time than I'm going to right now, but a lot of atheists think it's an intellectual position, even though um, they can't disprove that there is a God, but they sort of take a stance that, no, there is no God. And I think a lot of people think it's an intellectual position, but it's really an emotional position. I really believe that at the heart of that argument of 
resistance to believing that there is a God is an emotional thing. And I think that's why the suffering thing comes up so much. Because it's more that they feel they've been scorned in some way. Because they see so much going on in the world or probably in their own life or in their family's life. Um, and they say, well, what kind of God wouldn't respond to this? But that's right there, the, the pivotal thing there, is that God is waiting for people to respond to him. And the gospel has gone out. And maybe people aren't willing to hear that. You know, we talk a lot of times about how at Reformed Church, the things the Lord has taught us is very different than what you're hearing in the church today. That may be true. But there is a foundational concept, a found, there, there are foundational principles of the gospel that are being taught all through the earth right now on how to receive salvation, to receive it by faith and believing in Jesus. It's distorted a lot of times, but there are people that are teaching that soundly on how to get saved. And the gospel has gone out, and people may be willing to hear it or not, but God is actually waiting for people to respond to him. Now, here's the, here's the, the part that is so, uh, sort of missed by most Christians, is that that what, the, what a lot of Christians are not preaching is that Jesus actually provided the fix to every single problem, every physical problem, that he, he provided that at the cross, right? We know at this church there are only two problems that came into the world through Adam, sin and death, and wouldn't you know, Jesus died for our sins. He covered all the problems of the world, okay? You may not know how to reconcile that yet with what you're seeing in your life, but you can trust Scripture that when it says that Jesus died for our sins, those are the only two problems that came through Adam, according to Romans 5, and he fixed all of our physical problems, so Christians don't preach that to people. They don't preach that if you will just respond to the Lord, you can receive healing for your body. If you will just respond to what he already did, you can receive resurrection for your dead loved ones. If you will just respond to what the Lord has done, you can see emotional pain just completely relieved and just be a distant memory, so much so that you'll forget that you ever even felt that. Um, Joseph, even he experienced the Lord prospering him in his life, and he actually says that the Lord made him forget the toil that he went through, and the hardship that he went through when he was in, in his younger days. The Lord is able to renew your mind, so the things that you are accustomed to are the, the new things of the Lord, and you end up just forgetting what it's like to be a poor person in this world. I don't just mean poor financially, even though it includes that, but I mean a poor person in this world, someone without hope, or going through emotional distress, or trauma, or feeling vulnerable all the time, or feeling shy, or timid, or scared. The Lord is able to erase those things from your mind. It's called the renewal of your mind. And Christians aren't teaching people that, that all these things are available to you if you would just respond to the Lord. But at the basic level, Christians are generally speaking to people on, 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 on asking people to respond to the Lord, at the very least for salvation or for salvation from hell is really what they're teaching a lot of times, or for relationship with God. But I will say at the bare minimum, and I'm not content with this, and neither should any Christian be, but at the bare minimum, there is a word that has gone out into all the world asking for people to respond to the Lord. And again, it doesn't answer the suffering question very much, but that much is being said. But a lot of people, they, their, their biggest, I think really at the core of atheism and at the core of hesitancy even toward God are things of that nature. If God, then why this? Then why is this happening in my life? Then why would he let this? Why would he let this? Why would he let this? Because they really do believe that God is letting the things happen, and they're waiting on God to respond. And I think that's why I said before that I really believe that if you were to tell people that Jesus is sitting right now, it would just further offend them if they didn't see that in context, because they would say, well, that just throws gasoline on the fire to say that all this is going on, and he's sitting in heaven but it's because they don't understand the words, it's finished. They really don't understand those words. Jesus really did a great job. That is something that you're not hearing in the church today. The church reserves certain problems as problems that you will just go through. I've never heard a single preacher say otherwise. And I regret saying that, but I've never, the best preachers I know of reserve certain problems to say, well, that's, you know, we live in a fallen world, or whatever the explanation may be. There is no problem that Jesus did not fix. Every single problem he fixed. And you know what? That's a great starting point. With the, the example I just gave you about sin and death, you know, all things being categorized under either sin or death. Sin is wrong actions, wrong thoughts, you know, lust and all that kind of stuff. Um, and death is corruption and aging and weakness and being tired and growing weary and being faint. Um, 
the things that are not eternal but fading, that's corruption, okay? Everything in this world is sin or death, and Jesus fixed both those things. That as just a starting place, as a jumping off point, is great. Because even if you don't know what, how to categorize the problem you're going through, to just have the, the consolation to know that, well, it is fixed, though. And being a Christian now is just finding out how. That's an excellent place to be in. And the church is not teaching that. I, I, it is really I, it's so regrettable that one would have to say that, that we have a Savior that came and we're waiting on him for certain things, even as a church, let alone the world waiting for God to respond to our problem. And we feel that we pray to God and he responds to us. Meanwhile, our prayer, the reason why the Bible says that in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. The reason why it says that in Philippians is because he, the Bible says that whenever you pray, you should always give thanks accompanied. Even if you ask for something to manifest outwardly, always give thanks for it also. Why would he say that? Because there's nothing that you can ask to manifest that he didn't already accomplish at the cross. Your, 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 your supplication, that which means asking, your asking God should never be without thanksgiving. Because even when you pray, it's for your own mind. It's an acknowledgement for your own mind. Lord, I trust you to manifest this thing in my life. Therefore, I supplicate to you. Let it be by your spirit and not by my works. I ask you to do this, Lord. But thank you so much for having accomplished this already. You see, see what I'm doing? I'm saying, Lord, I trust you to manifest it on the outside as I look to you. But I can't ask you to manifest something without thanking you also for it because you've already done it. That is a prayer that's not asking for a response from God. That's a prayer of response to God. God is waiting for us to respond to him. Even for his second coming, he's looking to people and saying, I want you to acknowledge my truth, and that will bring to pass the promise of my second coming. But I'm waiting for my elect. The, 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 uh, the wheat that just hasn't accepted me yet, I don't want to pull the tares up yet, because I know there are people out there that will receive me. And I'm not going to send anyone to destruction that would receive me. I'm waiting for people to respond. And that is how everything works with the promises of God. The Bible says that all of the promises of God are in Jesus, yes, and are in him, amen. That means that by the blood of Jesus, you already have your yes. You don't have to ask. That's why once you establish in your mind that Jesus provided something, you no longer have to ask permission for it anymore. It's already a yes. The fact that a price was paid and the gift was given is a yes. It's like someone giving you a birthday present and you asking them if you can have it. It just doesn't make any sense. You don't ask for things that someone already paid for and gave you. Uh, it, just, it, it doesn't make sense. When someone pays for something and already offers it to you if you're the world or has already given it to you in that sense, if you're a Christian, you don't ask for it anymore. Now you just, you're responding to the gift by using it. That's what faith is. Faith is just using the things that Jesus has already given us. And that's all. We're, we're not here right now because we're going to call God down and we need fresh fire or we need a fresh move of God or we don't need any fresh anything. The beautiful thing about Jesus' work is it's always fresh. It's always fresh. It's always, it's always uh, brand new. There's no growing old with it. Um, contrary to popular belief, time doesn't age things. Corruption ages things. Time doesn't we're just used to, as time goes by, seeing things age or seeing things grow old, but that's not how the kingdom of God works. Things always remain young and fresh and new, um, regardless of the time. And everything that Jesus did is directly applicable today, as much as it was yesterday. You don't need fresh anything from God. Um, you just need to respond to what he already did. That's the words, it is finished, um, are sort of the resounding proof for what I'm telling you right now. Because if you were waiting, it wouldn't have been finished, right? And people, a lot of times, their rebuttal to that is, well, no, 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 I believe it's finished. I just don't believe that he was finishing all the problems of the world. It was just sin and death. But, again, if you heard what I just said, you know <laughs> that is all the problems of the world. People just don't know how to categorize the problems they're going through. They just don't realize that they fall under those categories. But we are responding to the Lord. He's all, if there's any time that ever goes by in our life where we're receiving a promise, listen, God is not being impatient with us. I mean, we just read, the Lord is patient toward us. And this is not just talking about being patient with believers. In this particular point, he's actually talking about even being patient with unbelievers so they can believe. How much more should we not be confident? The Lord is patient with us. He has patience with us. He's not rushing. He knows that um, in our mind renewal process, it does take continuance. Not to mention the fact that we don't always learn as quickly as we can also, right? Even the pace at which we move isn't always because 
You know, I've never been distracted with anything. I'm moving and learning as fast as I possibly can. The Lord even knows that even if you're getting distracted, he's still patient with you. And of course, regardless of whether you're distracted right now or whether you weren't or whatever, the Lord is patient with us to learn. But it's a patience with us. You see, if people understood how the promise of God worked, they would look at the suffering in the world and say, you know what? I'm just being patient with people. They'll get the clue soon enough. At least some of them will. That would be the response. Not that I'm being patient with God. Like, what is he doing up there? The people, what's missing in the whole logic? The atheism logic of the suffering in the world. What's, what's missing in the logic is the finished work of Jesus. And that's always what's missing. Any doctrinal issue that anyone has is always drawn back to a problem with what you believe about Jesus. If you understood what Jesus did at the cross properly, you would have understood the whole gospel properly because the message of, uh, of, of the gospel is called the message of the cross. It's called Christ and him crucified, according to 1 Corinthians. It really is. So understanding Jesus what just heals all of those things. You wouldn't be asking God to respond or feeling like, why God, why God? Or God, why did you allow this? It's, it's all gone. In fact, I wouldn't even have to address it. If you understood Jesus properly, if everybody just understood Jesus and what he did at the cross properly, you would never even have to address those questions about why God, why did God allow this? What's the answer? It is finished. That's, that's the answer. It's always the answer. It is finished. God's being very, see, in, in someone that, you know, the rel relative that's sick and suffering. Someone very well might be offended at this, but this would be the truth. And they say, well, we're just waiting on God's timing. My response would be, you know what, Jesus finished everything. And maybe I wouldn't say it in this many words to it, but this would be the truth of the matter, that Jesus already finished everything, and he's just being patient with us. He's being patient with you, with your mom. He's being patient with, with, with us. And peep, that would just be like a, uh, such a, 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 a turn, um, uh, what's the word, like a, a, a difference of perspective to hear, patient with me. How can you possibly say that if I'm going through something, a hardship, that God's being patient with me? I didn't do anything wrong. But it's not about sin or anything, action, having done something wrong. Um, in fact, you might be doing everything right in your learning. You might even be. I mean, I'm not saying every Christian is, but you might be doing everything right even in your learning. And God is still being patient with you because if even just the time it takes to learn, because it takes time to learn, he's being patient with you. Just because you go through something at a particular time doesn't even mean that you even did something wrong in your faith or did something wrong in your mind. And for a lot of people, it is because they have rejected certain truths. But for a lot of people as well, especially, you know, I'm speaking to people at this church, you very well may be learning and growing in the right truth. You're, learning, you're hearing the right stuff, in it, but it just takes time to learn. And so, therefore, God is still being patient with us. So whether someone is totally distracted, rejecting him right now and will come around soon, or whether someone is learning all the right things but just needs time to learn, he's being patient with us. And for those that are learning, his power is toward you who believe. Every Christian knows something about Jesus, therefore the power of God's already working in every single believer every single day at every moment of the day. But we want to increase in that manifestation all of us do, and therefore, as you learn, this power is toward you who believe. And it will increase, and God is being patient with us. We just keep If you just keep your eyes on the Lord, he says, you know what, I'm being patient, let's learn. I'm going to keep showing you, keep showing you, keep leading you, keep leading you into all the things that you have on the inside of you. He's patient, he knows it takes time to learn, even if you're doing everything right and learning and you never got distracted, it still takes time to learn. And he says, you know, I'm going to be patient with the fact that you're learning and I'm going to keep showing you the truth, and you will know the truth, and the truth will manifest that freedom in you. That will happen. That will happen. But if we are patient, we're patient with ourselves. We're never being patient with God, ever. His timing was 2,000 years ago. It's a great point to make to people. God's timing to heal you was 2,000 years ago. And people were receiving it even before that, mind you. But his timing to provide it was 2,000 years ago. His timing to receive these things, in fact, um, even in part, in the, in the Old Testament, has been every single day, even before Christ's coming. But his, time, his timing to provide these things was 2,000 years ago, and we are responding to what he already did. And that's why you see suffering in the world today, and that's why even if we go through problems, you know what, I could stub my toe, I can hurt, I can hurt myself in some kind of way, and I don't believe in those things. I really don't believe in those things for me. I don't believe that they're a part of me. And that's all the Lord can ask of anybody. Just don't believe that they're yours. Um, but even so, I know that that's me being patient with myself. That's all that is. Um, and we are learning and we're growing here. Um, but as far as the timing of God, as far as 
when God would prefer or want us to receive, he already designates a certain day to receive. He already does that. Let, let's go over to, um, to Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3. All right. Um, and as I said, too, I don't, I don't want to represent as if, like, when I say that God's being patient with us, I really mean he's being patient with us, just the way that in the scripture we just read, because it, this is not as if God is somehow, um, him being patient with us means, like I said before, that it even necessarily means that you're doing something wrong in your mind, or that God is disappointed in you somehow because he's just kind of waiting around for you. No, he knows it takes time to learn. Like, God knows that. The Bible says that it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. That means it takes time for your understanding to grow. The parable of the seed and the sower, you see that growth process of the seed before the fruit is born. Um, the Bible says that you have need of patience so that after you have um, continued, that you would, um, I forget the exact wording right now, but that after you've continued, that you would inherit, that you would inherit the promise, that you would receive the promise. I think that's in Hebrews chapter, um, chapter 10. So all of this, you have to understand, it's not God's disappointment in, in, in someone because he's waiting for something. It does take time to grow even if you're actually growing. Uh, but he, it, 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 is, it is us growing to respond to him, and it's not him needing to respond to us. It really is. It, it really is finished. Um, so there's a lot of context I can give Hebrews chapter 3. Let's start out in verse 1, and I'm going to skip a bunch here, but Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, that is a cool thing I could, I could spend more time on. But remember even um, uh, a few, actually the last service that we were here, um, I was talking, the message was called Perfect and I Know It. And I was saying that Paul said that he was laying hold on, uh, uh, pressing toward the prize for the upward call of God. Right, the upward call. And um, that's saying the same thing here. Paul was pressing toward to lay hold on this upward call, in other, this call to the things of above. He was doing that then, in that time that he was writing it. He was laying hold on the things of heaven. The, the things he was being called to were the things of above. Um, here it's saying the same thing, that we can, in fact, partake of heaven. We've been called to the things of heaven, and we are partakers, currently, partakers of the heavenly calling. Uh, but let, let's skip a bunch here, and let's go to verse 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Um, notice the subject here is unbelief. Unbelief um, that's only talking about people that are just not believing in what Jesus did for them. That's all that's talking about here. And it says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, which I believe that sin is still talking about that same unbelief. And it says, but it says to exhort one another daily, while it is called today, um, lest any of you be hardened. It says, verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ, the way we just read in verse 1, that we can partake of the heavenly calling. We're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. That means it takes continuance in that belief to partake of the things that are ours. In verse 15, while it is said, today, if you will hear his, hear his voice, uh, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. This is talking about when Israel was in the wilderness and how they didn't believe the Lord. Um, in particular, in the initial passage that sort of he's, he's um, referring to, this is Numbers, I think, chapter 14. The people of Israel were not allowed to enter the land of Canaan because um, of their unbelief. The Bible says in Numbers 14, um, how long before they will believe me, God said. How long before they will believe me? And then he swore that they would not see the land. Okay, there's a lot of context I can give this, but um, let's just read a few more verses, and I'll, I'll give you more of that context. So he says, um, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Again, referring to Israel, when he says provocation, and then when, the, when they provoked the Lord, that's talking about their unbelief in the wilderness. And in verse 16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with, with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that sinned? That word sin is talking about unbelief there. And it says, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he, or swear he, that they should not enter his rest, but to them that believed not, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's dwell on verse 18 for a second. To whom swear he that they should not enter his rest, but to them 
that it says believe not. If you switch to New King James, that actually says to them that were disobedient. The word disobedient in the New Testament can kind of go both ways, like uh, not believing uh, something or not obeying something can kind of go both ways. Um, so that should probably say to them that were disobedient. But even that disobedience is talking about their unbelief. But notice that it says that the, the Lord told them they could not enter his rest because they believed not, or in New King James, they were disobedient. And you know that disobedience is talking about unbelief, because next verse, he says, um, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That was their disobedience that kept them out of the land. But um, the reason why they didn't enter, obviously, was not because of God's timing, which we're going to read about in just one second. And you can queue up Hebrews chapter 4. The reason why they didn't enter was because they didn't believe. This is actually saying that God had prepared something for them to enter, which I'll explain probably briefly in a second. God had prepared something for them to enter, but they didn't enter because they didn't believe. And in fact, God said about these people, and again, these people were just, they were unbelievers and they just refused to understand the gospel. So they were kind of on, fully on that end of the spectrum. But God said, how long before they believe me? That doesn't sound like somebody who Israel was waiting for. This sounds like someone who was waiting for Israel. How long before they believe me? I've shown them my word. I've given them my word by Moses, and they haven't believed me. I've confirmed this, the gospel, through even signs and wonders throughout their stay in the wilderness, and they haven't believed me. And how long until they believe me? And then it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, let us therefore fear. Now, this is talking about people that might refuse the gospel. But it says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Um, let me see real quick. I just want to see if I um, get to a particular verse here. Look at verse 6 real quick. Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So it confirms that fact again. They didn't enter because of unbelief. Again, he limits a cer or designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is written today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Look at, look at verse 6 again. It says, it remains that some must enter. Now, when it's talking about entering the Lord's rest, I've taken many messages to prove that that's actually talking about the new earth. All right, I'm not going to do that right now. It would take too much time, but the rest here is not talking about just sort of a sense of relaxation. It's talking about the finished work of Jesus, and that's provable because the rest that he is actually quoting, because these are all quotes from the book of Psalms, and it's a quote also from Numbers uh, 14. In the initial quote, the Lord never says, they won't enter my rest. It actually, in the original quote in Numbers 14, it says, all of the earth will be filled with my glory. That certainly is not talking about Canaan. All of the earth will be filled with my glory, and they will not see the land because they didn't believe him. Okay? Canaan is just a symbol of new earth. The fact that they didn't enter Canaan because of unbelief was only a symbol of the true land that they weren't entering, the things of the new earth that they weren't entering because of their unbelief. Again, I, I taught a whole series called Enter New Earth, and I, I, I prove all these things there. It's, it's really not even a, a question in my mind. It, it, it's very, very plainly documented in Scripture, um, what I'm telling you right now. But... Um, this rest here is actually talking about a land. In fact, it, not only is it talking about a land, throughout the book of, um, even in the book of Deuteronomy, it calls Canaan that rest, right? Even Canaan, being a symbol of the new earth, is called the rest of the Lord. And uh, just to symbolize the new earth. And furthermore, um, the Lord, um, yeah. If you would even read, where is it? Verse 8. It's actually the next verse, verse 8, in the New King James Version. It says, um, yeah, sorry, if you can go back to the New King James just one more time for me. If Joshua had given them rest, they would have not, then he would not have spoken of another day. So basically what he's trying to say here is, this rest is a land. He's actually kind of assuming the people he's writing to already know that the rest he's talking about is not like a sense of relaxation or a comfort of your heart. He knows, he's writing as if they already know that this rest is talking about a land. Because he said if Joshua had given them the rest, the true rest, then he wouldn't have afterwards spoken of another day. But Joshua, what did Joshua lead the people into? We know, right? He led them into Canaan. Not, not 
relaxation. You know what I mean? Like he left, the, he led them into Canaan. So he's assuming you know that when he says rest, that you're, he's talking about a land, a place. And that's why he said, well, if Joshua had actually given them the true rest, or that, that land, Canaan, if Canaan was the true land, then it, w- it, w- it would not have been spoken of that we could still enter into this rest on another day. So all of that is a little bit of background to understand the term rest. So I won't go any further into that. I, I hope that you know, most of us are already with me on that. Go back to verse 6. He says, it remains that some must enter therein, into this land, into this place, which is talking about the things of the new earth. It's like saying the things of heaven. Uh, that's why he started out in chapter 3, verse 1, saying that we can partake of this heavenly calling. And here it says, it remains that some must enter therein. In other words, there is a promise left. There is access left for people to enter this rest. People, it turns out, people just don't enter what Jesus has already provided, his finished work and his rest. They just don't enter it because of unbelief, as this verse says. But then you go to verse 7, and it says, even though God has limited a certain day, for what? For entering the rest. It said there remains a day to enter. There remains um, uh, that some must enter. This, this, this inheritance that the Lord has provided. We'll just call it the inheritance for now. It remains that some must enter this inheritance. But although people don't enter because of unbelief, it doesn't mean that God still didn't designate a certain day for people to enter, and that day is today. Does that sound like a God that we're waiting for? He has already designated a day for everybody to receive of this quote-unquote rest, which he is referring to the finished work, the things of new earth that perfection of new earth, the things of the resurrection age, which Paul says in Philippians 3 that he was actively at the time laying hold on those things of the resurrection and was fully persuaded that he was able to attain to all of Jesus' resurrection, the perfection that he saw in Jesus. And that's what he said that he was striving forward and pressing forward to lay hold of in the day in which he was writing it. He still has not laid hold of it fully, Paul. He still can the point I'm making from Philippians 3, that is he knew, the writer of Philippians in chapter 3, believed that it was accessible to him to lay hold on the entire resurrected Jesus and all that he saw in him at the time. This is saying here, and not just in verse 6, but also in, um, uh, it's still chapter 4, but verse 1, let us therefore fear lest a promise being le- left us of entering his rest. That rest is the inheritance that Jesus has already provided. And there is a promise left to everybody to enter these things. People don't suffer or don't enter the things of the new earth because it's just in God's timing. You see, when, when, when it's left or, or taught that it's just in God's timing and we just don't know why God does things the way he does, it really makes, there's no, there's no other way to perceive God than to perceive him as a monster. Christians just sort of fumble over their words when they get that question. Like, it's a very hard question for them to, to answer. Well, why suffering in the world? They look over at God, and they're like, you know what, I don't really know why God does this. Because if they were to say, well, God just isn't doing anything about it, it would. There's no way else to perceive him but that he's a monster, letting all these things happen. But when you realize what this chapter is saying, and what we just were reading as well in Peter, in 2 Peter also, and that is that God is waiting for people to believe him. People don't fail to enter perfection. They don't fail to enter the things of new earth. They don't fail to enter the things of heaven because God doesn't want them to or because God is not allowing it right now. God has designated a day for everyone to enter these things, and that day is today. He limits a certain day for entering this quote-unquote rest, this heavenly place that he's reserved for everybody, God's timing is today for you to receive. That's the time. And just so you know, this is, again, I'm not saying that as sort of like a motivational thing. God's timing is for you today. Um, I'm just telling you what this chapter is saying. God's timing for us to receive is today. If people fail to enter something, it was because of our unbelief, not because the Lord somehow didn't have it in his timing or that we were waiting on the Lord. Now, as I said, when he's talking about unbelief here, he is talking about people that are just, have rejected the gospel. But even for those who have accepted the gospel and are learning, it still takes time. But as long as we know that today is the day to enter perfection, to lay hold on that perfection, today is the day that God designates, it really helps, of course, to know that the word rest here 
he is talking about the perfection of new earth when the earth is filled with the Lord's glory. Um, and that's what it's talking about. The day to enter this rest is today. Of course, you'd have to know that first. But uh, assuming that you already do know that, that's what this is talking about. Today is God's day for people to enter. And if anything happens in our life or someone else's life, it's something that we need to respond to the Lord and get to know about the Lord. And there are so many people, again, it's particularly sort of talking to this church, people that are learning the right truth, endeavoring and continuing in those things, in which case there's nothing more for you to do except to do that all the more. It's just to continue to know Jesus and to learn what's yours in Christ. And you will enter these things. In fact, it says that we who believed do, do enter this rest. I believe it's in this chapter. We who believe do enter this rest. But the time that the Lord has designated for people to receive is today. Um, so many people, would there'll be so many misconceptions just corrected about God if they really understood what we're talking about tonight. That Jesus, God already sent Jesus to provide the fix to everything. The day that he's designated for us to receive it is today. And why not today? Because it's already finished. God has designated for people to receive him today. If someone's not saved, he wants them to get saved today. If someone's not feeling well, he wants people to be feeling well today. And yesterday was also the day to receive. And the day before that was also the day to receive. Every single day is the day for people that God wants people to receive and to receive manifestly in full to the outside of their body to receive perfection on the outside. A lot of people don't believe that. And of course, tonight is not the day for me to prove all, all of these things. You have to be coming for a long time to understand uh, how Jesus really provided that perfection. But suffice it to say, the quickest way I have for you to tell you that Jesus fixed all of our problems, which is why I mention it so frequently, is that sin and death concept I gave you before. Jesus has already fixed all the problems of the world. And if you really believe that the only thing that came in through Adam is sin and death, as Romans says, then you have to admit that Jesus really took the problems of the world on himself at the cross. And that being said, no wonder the Lord says, every single day that, that you go through is a day in which I want you to receive perfection. There is no part of this, no part of perfection that we're waiting on God for. There's nothing that we're waiting on God for. Everything is people learning and receiving what's finished. People learning, and particularly with Christians, receiving what's on the inside of them. We're learning something. It's, Lord, show me what you did. I want to enjoy what you did because the thing is you need to enjoy the process as a believer. You need to enjoy the process because there are so many beautiful things that you've already learned that you need to continue meditating on. And just to know that, let me read you the verse. Um, and did you put it up there? Yeah, verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest. The encouragement to know that if you will believe the Lord and if you will continue in the truth, you do, ent you do enter the rest and will continue to enter that rest, continue to enter the things of new earth. Continue to enter and lay hold on the perfection the Lord has given you. You need to enjoy the process in getting to know the Lord because you worrying is not, it can't add a cubit to your stature and it also can't make you grow faster. It really can. I didn't mean that to rhyme, but it, it, it worked. It's not going to make you grow faster because you worry about your growth. You need to commit, as long as you are listening and focusing your attentions on the Lord, meditate on him day and night. I, that, that's our part in this. Please recognize that you have a shepherd of your soul. It, it's, it's for the Lord to teach you. Glean from him. Lean on the fact that you have a shepherd. When you forget that you have a shepherd and the learning becomes all about just you, uh, that, that would freak anybody. It would freak me out too. In fact, it has in my life before when, I'm, when I've not acknowledged that I have a shepherd to teach me and lead me through this whole thing. Um, we listen to him and we receive his word. All the Lord's asking is today, if you hear my voice, just don't harden your heart against my voice. But as you believe, you do enter his rest. Um, but the point I want to drive home, which I'm pretty much closing right now, is um, people misunderstand. The day that God wants people to receive is today. Why don't people? Either one, because they've rejected the truth like we're reading about right now. In Israel's case, they just didn't believe it. In which case, God said, how long before they'll believe me? That's all I want from them. I just want them to believe what, I've, what I'm going to do. Because in the Old Testament, it was okay to say they wait on the Lord. If you notice... There, I, I wish I had the passages on hand right now. There are portions of Scripture that say that uh, 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 that speak about the the sort of um, prosperity of those who wait on the Lord, and then in the New Testament it quotes it as saying that those who trust in the Lord. Very interesting because he's just updating the verse. Because in the Old Testament it was okay to say you're waiting on the Lord. In fact, you received 
from God based on your waiting. Because back then, waiting was, I'm acknowledging a Messiah that's still to come. So that, that's how you receive. Faith back then could almost be interchanged with the word waiting because it means I am believing something is coming. So that's how they received. But now that word wait's not there anymore. It's those that trust in the Lord, those that trust what he's already done. We're not waiting for anything. It's okay if you're reading the Old Testament, those that wait in the Lord and how they'll renew their strength. That's a perfectly good thing to be written in the Psalms. Perfectly good. Because that's how they received back then, because their Messiah hadn't come yet. Turns out our Messiah already came, so for us to be waiting for something is actually wrong in the New Testament. Now it's just, and, 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 and a little tidbit, again, I am closing here, but the whole, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart against it, the whole concept of today is the day that God wants us to receive, that was also written in the Psalms. David knew even before the Messiah came that despite the fact that he was waiting, today was the day for him to receive and glean from the Messiah's provision. The Lord was able, they were, allowed them to receive even ahead of the payment. How much more can we not receive who live after the payment? There's so much misunderstanding about God, and a lot of it comes down to things we're talking about tonight. Um, they really believe that God has to respond to the suffering in the world, but man, there is a, there is a person that has suffered more than you have ever suffered in your life. You, you, you might think, I think probably everybody without knowledge, you, you go through something and you think that your problem is just the biggest thing in the whole world. You think that like, no one's suffering like I am, no one has ever gone through this, and uh, God, why not? Why didn't you do this? Why, why are you allowing this? Uh, why aren't you fixing this? And it, it turns out there is someone who has suffered more than you have ever suffered, who has given up more than you have ever given up. And that was God's response at the cross to what you're going through right now or what anyone could ever go through. God established a finished work through Jesus to rid the entire world of all of its impurity and all of its imperfections once for all time. I'm talking about imperfections that don't, I'm not talking about a hurt in your body. I'm talking about an imperfection like, you know, your nose is a little crooked or your cheeks are a little too chubby or whatever. I'm, I'm talking about that stuff. That's like next level that we, I, won't even, I won't even address in this message because we, we still haven't gotten the thing down pat about the, the dead being raised. So let's not even quite get there yet. But I'm saying every imperfection turns out, as you believe Jesus, you are transformed into his same image, into his same appearance even. But for now, let's just talk about the bigger stuff in our mind. I put that in quotes for those on audio. Um, the Lord has fixed everything. And uh, Jesus suffered, took all the suffering of the whole world on himself. He was a man of pains, acquainted with sickness. Read Isaiah 53 in the Young's literal translation or in the LSV. Those are literal translations of the Bible. Um, man, I could teach on that right now, but that's what Jesus did for us. And it is finished. He took your pain on himself. He took all your suffering on himself. He didn't have to do it again. He is now in the role of just getting the word out now. That's what this church even exists for. This is why I so appreciate Pastor Jose and Miss Kim's idea of a church to be about the gospel. Because that's all that we're doing right now. We're giving people a clue of what's done, just getting the word out. And even for believers, the Lord just wants to get the word in our mind about, wow, this is really done, I really have it, and these things will manifest, and we will enter these things as we believe them. Uh, but it is always a response to the Lord and him being patient with us and not him responding to us and somehow us being patient with him. It really is. Jesus finished everything. Such good news. Um, all right, I think we're going to probably close right there. That was good. Um, again, if you guys have any questions afterwards, you know you're always free to, to ask about anything, uh, but let's just pray. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you have done for us, Lord, and even us being at this church shows, Lord, that we are people that are responding to you. We are people that are learning from you and growing, Lord. And we thank you for the promise and the hope of the fact that as we believe these things, we do enter these things. It is inevitable. It is the inevitable outcome, Lord. We enter these things. We lay hold on these things. Thank you so much, Jesus. We do lay hold on these things as you teach us. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, let me just interrupt the, uh, the prayer here. If we can just bring the lights up again. Um, I, want, I, want, I want to leave you with this, because this, I think, finishes the thought. We just read this recently, and I just want to read you a couple things from this, and I'll let you go. 
the whole time today we've been talking about um, when. When does God want people to receive? It's a time thing. We've been talking about this entire service, right? That it's, it's today. God wants people to receive today. That's God's timing, right? We've been talking about the timing of God. Um, but also, it's, it's sort of like this. This is the way I was seeing it when the Lord was showing me. It's um, yes, all of it. Yes, now. Because those are two things that are not understood by the church. Yes, now is the timing part. Yes, God wants it now, not later, now. If there's ever anything that is put off, it's because we're learning or other people are learning. It's, it's, it's people's learning and quote-unquote repentance, right? So that's the now part. Yes, God wants it now, and, but, but how much now? All of it. That's why he, when he, the word rest, it's important to know that that's the new earth because that would basically mean enter into his perfection. But I just want to remind you of something that we read um, last Sunday or the past Sunday that we were here in, uh, in, in, in Philippians 3.10. Paul talked about knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And, and there's, I, I told on that in that message, um, perfect and I know it. But he says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings is talking about being crucified with Christ, being made conformable to his death. But notice that it, it, it's his resurrection. The, the, the resurrection he's referring to is Jesus' resurrection, right? That's the thing we need, it's important to carry from that verse. His pow, the power of his resurrection in verse 11. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. That means that he believed he was able to attain the power of Jesus' resurrection. This is not talking about inside of him. This is talking about manifesting it. That's what the word, when he talks about attaining it, that's what he's referring to. You can listen to that message for, for more information on that. Verse 12 says, not as though I'd already attained, either already perfect. Of course, he's only talking about, as you would know from listening to that message, that he's talking about on the outside, that he had not attained to all of it on the outside, to seeing all these things perfectly on the outside, but he followed after um, if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. He literally, again, I, I can't recommend that message enough to answer uh, this question further, but this passage, if you follow the whole thing through, Paul understood that he was able to attain the power of Jesus' resurrection. Later on, he says he already knew he had the perfection on the inside of them, on the inside of him. He already knew that he had um, already attained everything on the inside of him. When he said that he hadn't already attained or weren't already, wasn't already made perfect, he's only talking about the outside. So this sort of answers that other question uh, as to how much of the inheritance. We already got the timing down, Pat. When does God want you to receive the inheritance? Today. So yes, now. How much of the inheritance? Because people will say, okay, yes, today I'll give you that, but some of it is reserved for when Jesus comes back. Or we will go through certain things because we live in a fallen world. So how much? of the inheritance can we receive today? And Paul says here that he believed that he was able to attain perfection and that God had encouraged him to lay hold on perfection, the perfection of Jesus' resurrection. Again, I will leave the explanation of this to that other message I recommended you, um, but I just want to sort of leave you with that as well because Hebrews 6 says the exact same thing. That in everything that Jesus has already entered, our high priest, our forerunner, is that we have strong consolation from God to lay hold on that hope that is set before us. That hope is referring to Jesus' resurrection. If you follow that passage in Hebrews 6, it's talking about everything Jesus received in his resurrection and we have strong consolation from God to lay hold on those things. If you want a, a simpler verse, here's the simpler verse for people that don't understand anything I just said. Here's the simpler verse, Ephesians 1. It says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is toward us who believe. That's very simple. You want a simpler verse to even give someone else? Stick with Ephesians 1 then. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. The power that raised him as he is. No one would deny that Jesus is perfect today. No one would deny that Jesus is not feeling pain anymore. No one would deny that he's in perfect appearance and perfect health and perfect everything right now. And that's the power that's toward us as we believe. So how much of the inheritance? All of it. That you can receive and attain right now. And when? Today. So important. God's not holding anything back. He provided everything, gave you access to everything, and it's just us getting a clue of what's already been done. And thank God that the people that are here right now, that's what's, that's what's going on here right now. We are endeavoring to do that, and we just need to continue to do that all the more and tell other people about it. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry on this earth right now, is tell everybody what I already did so that they can respond by believing me. 
We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world. If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.